theatres of the observed mind. My name is Wendy Shore and I'm a public programme coordinator at Camberwell, Chelsea and Wimbledon Graduate School at University of the Arts London. And during the organisation of this event, I've been struck by the generosity of spirit and also the enthusiasm of, of all of those involved, um, from speakers right through to technical staff. So I'd like to take a little moment before we begin to say thanks to all the staff here at Arts Admin, and that would be particularly Mary, Chief and Nigel, who will be doing lighting and sound today. Uh, from the Graduate School, thank you to Gabriella, Programme Assistant, and also Nick and Ellie. Um, and thanks in advance to Hannah and our wonderful team of stagehands who will be helping us transition from paper to presentation to screaming and back throughout the day. Uh, this event was conceived of and would never have been possible without the brilliant mind of Zoe Mendelssohn. Zoe, you've been a delight to work with and of course you've curated a really fascinating programme. Special thanks to all our speakers, many of whom have travelled far to be with us today and thank you the audience for joining us. Um, I'm certain we're about to witness something truly special. Uh, so I'm going to pass you over to Zoe but before that I'd like to introduce her. So, Zoe Mendelssohn is an artist and writer. She is pathway leader for BA Fine Art Painting at Wimbledon College of Arts, where she co-curates the network Painting Research with Geraint Evans. Zoe's research engages disorder as a culturally produced phenomenon in parallel to its clinical counterpart, suggesting its value to knowledge production within fine art and critical theory. Her work has been widely exhibited internationally and she regularly speaks and performs at conferences and symposia. Zoe. day of talks, performance, screenings and a collage of worlds in between, where it is no longer possible to diagnose distinct modes of presentation and interaction. Um, you'll be, we'll be drawing upon histories of madness and its exhibition and considering how it has been staged as a cultural performance. And this event will consider behaviours and performances exchanged between viewer and physician in relation to patients. We'll be looking at the cultural implications of diagnostics, of representations of madness, and at its treatment through assigned images and restagings. I hoped, in putting this event together, that further repositionings will occur here, that by bringing together critical voices, negotiating these troubled waters, we will collectively shed new light on how culture negotiates madness and psychiatry. We invest in the exhibition, writing up, and the telling of mental illness as a territory in and of itself, a world parallel to patient experience. Our international speaker performers today are from diverse fields and will provide distinctly different takes on the subjects at hand. There will be opportunities to join in and opportunities in some cases for questions. I want to take a moment to thank all the contributors to this event for their time, their insight, and their willingness to engage with this multidisciplinary activity. I would also like to say a really big thank you to CCW Graduate School for supporting it, and to Wendy Short, who you just heard from, who has been invaluable in its coordination. Really, really enjoyed working with you on this, Wendy. Thank you to Arts Admin 2, who are hosting today, and making this theatre available to us. I propose the event with this space in mind, and it is very much a part and a character in the contextual model that's being presented here. <coughs> there is a long history of connections between madness and its observation towards a notion of it being viewed or played out as a cultural performance. Sites of psychiatry have, historically, objectified and taxonomised the patients that they have housed and or treated. Historical contextualising of the psychiatric institution as a site of entertainment and attraction alongside the objectification of madness, suggests how it and the museum are inextricably linked. Importantly, I have used the word madness in the blurb for today's discussions. 
I'm employing a term which can straddle past and present usages to include a set of psychological conditions and their cultural phenomenology. Madness is a word that has passed through being clinical, fashionable, and has emerged into a no man's land where it's colloquial, cinematic, artful, and politically incorrect. As such, it can be manipulated or reinvested. Madness has been used by historian Roy Porter popularly, theoretically and academically from Michel Foucault to Darian Leader, and within contemporary artistic practice. Most importantly, madness is performative in a way that mental health perhaps isn't. It's literary rather than clinical. It's not considered socially excluding to claim to feel a bit mad or to act mad. It can be adopted, adapted and twisted, played upon and disguised. It can be aspired to in an artistic sense. I can include myself in it. Madness feels practice-based. Darian Leader's book on misconceptions and public assumptions of madness and psychiatric practices is titled, What is Madness? He refutes common practices of diagnosis, including the classificatory systems of the DSM with its emphasis on surface and visibility, and notes that its very emphasis on using external features of behavior to define human beings may itself be a system of psychosis. So who's looking at whom? Historically, madness has had an audience. The very separation or consideration of minds as sane or insane denotes an active observation of the other. In many ways, the asylum, with all of its tools of containment, has also been a museum since inception, with the earliest European institutions financing themselves through regular invitations to paying visitors to come see the fools. Bequests and legacies were attracted to asylums through the showing of pitiable objects which was 17th century parlance for the objectified insane, and they often relied upon visitors of quality to, to remain afloat. At Bethlehem, London, until, sorry, at Bethlehem, London, until 1770, almost unlimited sightseeing was allowed, with visits far off to minimised because of lewd behaviour, and this was of visitors, not patients. Alongside the necessary generation of income through the attraction of wealthy patronage, the open doors of the European asylum also attracted a crowd, hell-bent on entertainment. The earliest London guidebooks produced in the 17th century noted Bethlehem among the sites to see. Public holidays were particularly busy times for those asylums opening their doors to visitors. Sometimes inmates would be required to perform or parade their ills through an engagement in normalised holiday activities, such as in Den Bosch in the Netherlands, where warm cakes were eaten by inmates as a spectator sport at carnival time. Foucault writes in Madness and Civilization of the display of the insane at Bicetre in pre-revolution France that one went to see the keeper display the madmen the way the trainer at the fair of Saint-Germain put the monkeys through their tricks. Witness accounts and historians speculate that madness played to the gallery on such occasions and that in return for food and attention, a show was put on. There are witness accounts of provocations of inmates from asylum staff and attendants, thereby implicating them in public performances of insanity as generators of both cash and public interest. Foucault writes of the continued provocation of the spectacle of madness that the only extenuation to be found at the end of the 18th century was that the mad were allowed to exhibit the mad, as if it were the responsibility of madness to testify to its own nature. All of this assumed that madness was something visible, to be publicly witnessed and somehow recognised, rather than unconscious, an idea now aptly contested in law and psychiatry, as well as in common knowledge. The popular writer of the subject, Roy Porter, describes this 18th century view of madness as a trust placed in nature's legibility, and he tells of a need to see madness as self-exteriorizing. There were indeed inner, as well as outer truths, but outward signs encoded inner realities. The location of this entertainment and documentation of the lunatic as an exhibit did not remain within the walls of the institution. Visitors to asylums who wrote and disseminated accounts of their experiences generated a spread of interest in the insane. Social historians and sociologists 
such as Jonathan Andrews and Irving Goffman, note the construction, amplification, and characterization of the insane in accounts of the day, giving rise to a babbling, riddling, howling impression of madness. Andrews suggests that this extrapolation evolved partly to reflect on the sane and the foibles of the sane outside the asylum, creating a comparative reflection and moral teachings. These accounts indicate the presence of a doubling up of the performed, an unspoken exchange of signs and gestures between the live aspects of madness as they were viewed by visitors to the asylum and their subsequent exaggerations and embellishments in narrative. Michel Foucault wrote in Madness and Civilization of Madness's recognition by mirror in the early 19th century asylum, detailing how it came to view itself as simultaneously pure spectacle and absolute subject, through increasing investment in the encouragement of self-observation. This refers to a transitional moment in institutional care of the insane, where a more human approach, known as moral treatment, steered by French physician Philippe Pinal, was slowly adopted in Western Europe. In the 19th century, asylum, uh, in the 19th century, attempts were made through psychological means, as opposed to earlier chains and violence, to persuade the madman of his madness in order to release him from it. Holding a mirror up to madness prompted an, inf an infinitely self-referring observation. It was finally chained to the humiliation of being its own object. This reciprocity, mirroring, or involvement in one's own care is often cited as the beginning of psychiatry, and this fractured self cannot be entirely self-referring, coerced as it is, not through the mirror, but through the suggestion to look, and of how to look. The reflection, therefore, cannot be solely that of madness and its object, but also the mise en rebe on a beam, the sort of repeating through mirrors of a complex doctor-patient reci reciprocal relationship with each having an investment in the other's viewpoint. My interest here is in how this refraction and fragmentation fractures the subject, losing them to a series of endless theatrical overlaps. <coughs> in Canadian sociologist Irving Goffman's seminal behavioural study of the sociological implications of theatre, The Presentation of Self in Everyday Life, which was published in 1959, the term dramaturgy is first imported into the humanities from the arts. Goffman's study implicates us all in a complex theatricalization of self via social expectations, <coughs> roles, sets and codes. He describes an unspoken expectation of the suppression of realities in exchange for the theatre of maintaining a superficial collective agreement. So Goffman notes that this veneer of consensus is facilitated by each participant concealing his own wants behind statements which assert the values to which everyone present <coughs> feels obliged. His later work, so Goffman's later work, Asylums, he in this he opposes, imposes some of these ideas about the construction of a performed self onto the experience of being an inmate in a psychiatric institution. He ruminates on the influence of the institution itself, not the condition on the continued construction of the self in relation to the social expectations, routines, and the environment of the asylum. So, in considering the historical construction of exchanges between inmate and observer in the vast museological galleries of Bethlehem and other European asylums, it is possible to see the beginnings of a collective cultural performing of madness, an exchange between the observed and the observer which has often masked the actualities of pathologies, complicated diagnostics, and exacerbated a collective thirst for a spectacular or entertaining version of disorder. These performances echo through history, from Bedlam's early days of welcoming visitors to see its lunatics in the 1520s, to Charcot's dramaturgy of the prize hysterics at the Salpetriere in the 19th century in Paris. Through his commissioned photography, and theatrical Tuesday lectures to their perhaps inevitable descendants in the reality television of our present. Charcot himself termed his place of work the Museum of Living Pathology. And this exchange between pathology and its performed or culturally implicated variant is the subject of today's event. 
We'll look at the background of madness as exhibition and the treacherous territory that is occupied by diagnostics as it crosses paths with museology, theatre, dance, the novel and the visual arts. <laughs>